Have you ever been uh, down about something in life? Have you ever had a, a dark night of the soul? Have you ever felt trapped, isolated, frustrated, depressed, abandoned? Have you ever been there in that moment? Have you ever been in that place? that place, the place of fear, the place of darkness, the place of depression, where anxiety, fear, and circumstances kind of overtake you, where you feel like your world is just caving in, where you feel depressed, and you really just need a friend. You need a friend who's just going to come in and be there, and be there, and pray with you, and listen Looking back in your life, in the history of your life, can you remember the lowest point in your life? Just the lowest place that you've been. Can you think back to that moment? That moment. You know, I grew up in the church, and... Uh, the Sunday school Jesus that was taught to me in Sunday school and at church. Uh, Jesus, when, whenever I saw him in any book, um, he was smiling. He was smiling. Um, I always pictured Jesus this way. I mean, he's happy, he's uh, smiling, and he's joyful. And I always kind of grew up thinking that's the way I have to be all the time, all the time. Um, you know, happy, smiling. How are you doing in church? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I I'm great. How, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. But I didn't always feel that way. I, I didn't, that wasn't always the way I was feeling, but you kind of feel like you have to, to be that way. And, and then life hit me hard when I was a young adult, in my 20s, my early 20s. And uh, I kind of opened the Bible for the first time, and I read through the Bible, read through the Gospels, and I saw that Jesus actually lived a very tough life. Jesus lived a hard life. It wasn't all smiles and, and sitting around the, the campfire and singing Kumbaya. It wasn't, you know, a lot of people didn't like Jesus when he was on earth. Um, a lot of people opposed him as they do today. But he lived on earth, I, Isaiah the prophet kind of prophesied, he said he's a man of sorrows. <laughs> Jesus was a man of sorrows. And he lived through suffering, and he taught us how to do the same. He taught us how to live in a sinful world, in the world that we live in. And he, he did it perfectly. And for me, at the age of 21, when I read through the Gospels, really for the first time completely, I decided that was someone that I could worship. That was someone that I could worship. Someone that has gone through, understands suffering, and understands the human condition. Real life. Today, we're going to continue on, the, on in the book of Mark. Mark 14, 32 to 42. And I want to say, this is one of the most uh, intense passages in all of Scripture. Uh, this event takes place during Thursday night of Passion Week. That's the seven days before Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's Thursday night. Jesus will be crucified the next day. It's getting late at night. The disciples, they had just eaten the Passover meal. And they had the Last Supper, and Jesus takes the disciples after the Last Supper, and they go to an olive grove, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is what it looks like, the garden. It's late at night, there's trees everywhere. Gethsemane actually means a oil press. They made olive oil there. It's located on the Mount of Olives just across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. And this was a place that the disciples had gone to with Jesus before. They were very familiar with this garden. Uh, 
as they're going to the garden, Judas is doing his thing. Judas is off. He's getting the soldiers. Uh, he's waiting till nighttime to come and arrest Jesus because he doesn't want to make a scene. Uh, Peter has just told Jesus that, hey, Jesus, I'll never deny you. And, and Jesus says, you know what? Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. There's a lot going on uh, right here. Mark 14, 32 to 42. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, this suffering. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words, and again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man, Jesus, is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayers are at hand. Jesus tells Peter, James, and John, they are his closest disciples, they are the closest to Jesus during his time on earth, his closest friends. He says, I'm greatly distressed and I'm troubled. Jesus here is in a bad spot. He's in an incredibly bad spot and his friends, they don't get it. They, they fall asleep on him. They get an F minus for friendship here. I don't know if there is such a grade, but <clears throat> terrible. They don't listen to him. They don't pray with him as he told, tells them to. And they're not present, which is what Jesus needed. And Jesus is in a bad place. As a human, we call this the dark night of the soul. That's what St. John the Cross called it. A really dark and difficult time. And just think about what Jesus is facing. He knows what's going to happen the next day. He's going to be crucified on the cross. He knows what's coming. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be falsely accused. He's going to have to carry a cross up the hill. He's going to be lashed 40 times. They're going to put a crown of thorns on his head. And they're going to mock him. And they're going to make fun of him. And he's going to die in excruciating and death on the cross for our sins. A punishment that's meant for criminals. And his friends, they're going to abandon him and betray him. He knows what's coming the next day. All that's bad, what I just mentioned. All, all that's terrible to think about. But here's another big thing. He will momentarily feel and lose close intimacy with the Father on the cross. That's why he yells, why have you forsaken me? He will take on God's wrath. It will be poured out on him. He doesn't even know what sin is like. It's going to be poured out on him. He will pay on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the world. This is so intense. When we say that phrase, the weight of the world is on his shoulders. It is here. The weight of the, the, the world is on his shoulders. Salvation is at stake. It's 100% stress here in the Garden of Gethsemane. We think stress is driving in, in rush hour on 30. Or we think stress is when the hot water heater you know, goes out. Or, or we think stress, or at least I do, is when you're on the phone for about an hour trying to get something done with your phone company. Or, or we might think stress when your, your football team loses. I said your football team. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. 
I would be stressed here. I mean, we see Jesus in one of his most vulnerable and darkest moments. And you could say, is he depressed? I guess you could say that. And here's the thing with us. We will have in our lives, or we have had, Gethsemane moments in our lives, and they will test us and our faith. They will test us and our faith. Maybe you remember those Gethsemane moments of your life. Betrayal, the death of a loved one, diagnosis, losing a job, a kid who rebels. Or you just cried out to God. You just cried out to God. You didn't know what to even pray. Or you just couldn't take it anymore. And, and these moments, they are hard and defining moments in our life. The way we react to them. And, and there's really two ways of dealing with these moments. Dealing with these kinds of suffering in, in our life. You know, a lot of religions, what they teach is to run around suffering. Uh, Buddhism ignores pain in its philosophy. Hinduism says it's best to just kind of go around, you know, pain. Christianity takes you through pain. Christianity is not as much, you know, God helping us live this incredibly peaceful, happy life all the time. Um, sometimes that does happen because we don't sin as much. But it's really about God taking us through the pain. And Jesus here goes through it, and it's hard. It's really hard. I think of the slay makers. They're going through it right now, and grieving their loss. But when we have a Gethsemane moment, we have two options. We can, one, we can choose to really take all of our pain, all of the moment's pain, and take it to God. We can wrestle with God about it. We can tell him what's on our heart, like David does in the Psalms. And we can go through it with God. Or we can become bitter at God for allowing it to happen. There are so many people in the world that are bitter at God for allowing something to happen to them. But if anyone can understand our Gethsemane moments, if there's anybody that can really sympathize with our weakness and the human condition, it's Jesus, our mediator. He understands. He gets it. Jesus can speak into the suffering in our life because he went through it. And he did it perfectly. He did it perfectly. He's a model for us. Luke's version of this story says that Jesus was sweating blood. He was sweating blood. He can do that. There's a missionary wife that I knew. And when she was giving birth to her son, she was under severe stress, and she started to sweat blood. It's called hematidrosis, very rare. Under immense stress, capillaries explode, maximum point of human stress. Jesus could have bled to death in the garden. John MacArthur said it was so severe of sorrow that it almost kills him. It almost kills him. My soul, he says, is very sorrowful, even to death, even to death. He's physically under intense anguish. And this situation, it's hard for us to totally grasp it as a human being. It's like no other situation known to man. We can't really fully realize the weight of the situation. His struggle is not really like our struggle a lot of this encounter surpasses our understanding because Jesus will experience the Father's will of being a sacrifice for sin. Jesus, who never has known sin, now he will take loads of it on. He will take the wrath of God on and be alienated from God and he struggles because of his holy nature. And yes, he's going to physically suffer on the cross but also the fullness of God's wrath would fall on him. I mean, this is like heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. And that's why Jesus' prayer 
under this pressure is so amazing. It's an amazing prayer. It's so real. He says, Abba, Daddy, that's an intimate term for, for God in Aramaic. Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup of suffering from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will, Father. What an incredible prayer. I mean, do you think that you could pray that in that moment? Not my will be done, Father, but your will be done. I mean, could you pray that in that situation? Not what you want, not what I want, but what you want, Father, God. That's hard to say knowing that you're going to get crucified the next day. You know, as Christians, I would say there's two ways that a lot of us can typically pray. Um, one we kind of see that um, God, we, we kind of secretly think that, that God is like a piñata. He's like a piñata of blessings, and uh, prayer is a stick, and we just try to poke the piñata for the blessings to get what we want, to get what we want. Basically, God is essentially Santa Claus for a lot of us, God, give me this. God, make this happen. God, I want them to like me. God, I want this. And that's okay. I mean, we can, God already knows what we want before we even ask him. I mean, we can have requests, but that's just one part of, part of prayer. Another thing that sometimes we do as Christians is we don't pray until we've got a problem. Maybe many people Prayer is a, is a last resort. It's an emergency that, you know, that's when most people pray. There's a fire. What do we do? We break the glass and then we pray. Our lives, I believe every one of us, our lives would change dramatically if we just took 20 minutes every day to pray. I believe that all of us, our lives would change dramatically. Jesus, here in the garden, he prays. Now, his whole life was prayer. You see him all throughout the Gospels go away and, and pray. But he prays here for a significant amount of time, probably an hour each time. Three times he asked God to take away this suffering, the cross, away from him, basically saying, is there another way? Is there another way? And it's a very human response. But each time at the end of his prayer, he submits himself to the will of God. Yet not what I will, but what you will. This is a good thing for us to practice when we are praying. Not my will, okay, this is what I want, and these are my requests, and, but not what I will, but Father, what you will. We can pray that at the end of our prayers. But we learn so many things from this, from this text. First of all, what was God's answer to Jesus? What was God's answer to Jesus? No. His answer was no. God's answer to our prayers, they can be yes, they can be no, and they can be wait. It's the same way I would answer my kids if it's 9 o'clock at night, you know, can I go swimming? No. Of course not. It's December. <laughs> can I get a snack before bed? Yes, you can get a snack before bed. That's reasonable. Can I get my driving license? No, you're 13. Wait, wait. But here's the thing. You find out a lot about your character, maturity, when God says no. So many people in their lives have turned from God because God said no to something. And many people don't like to be told no. We find out a lot about our, our character, our maturity when people say no. It reflects our heart. God's will is that Jesus goes to the cross. 
It's, it's the best. So here's the question for all of us. Do you trust God when he says no? Do you trust God when he says no? The second thing about Jesus here is Jesus was honest. I mean, there's great honesty to Jesus' request. He's being real with God. I mean, just spit it out already. God already knows what's on your heart. I mean, God is a mind reader, okay? He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's on your heart already. Matthew 6, 8 says, Do not be like them, for your Father knows, your Father God knows what you need before you ask Him. He knows what you need before you ask Him. Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Another thing about this is you can see in this interaction that Jesus trusts God. There is confidence even in this prayer request that God knows best. And despite the difficulty of it all, Jesus trusts God. And, and many times, God's answers are wiser than our prayers. God does know what is best for us. God doesn't make mistakes. And God is a good God. Was it good that Jesus died on the cross? Did it seem like it in this moment? No. Do we believe, do we trust God? Do we believe God will take care of us? Do we believe God will take care of us? Do we trust him in moments like this? And it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. It's really hard. So Jesus here is at his lowest point that we really see him. I mean, is he depressed? Yeah, probably. Uh, overwhelmed, for sure. I mean, under stress. I want to talk about the topic of depression. Um, it's kind of a hot topic um, within Christianity. Um, those that suffer from depression, uh, they can have intense feelings of sadness, intense feelings of anger, Tense feelings of hopelessness, fatigue, a variety of other uh, symptoms. Uh, they may begin to feel useless and even suicidal, kind of losing interest in things and people that they once enjoyed. Um, depression is a real thing. It's a real thing. And, and a lot of people struggle with depression. Um, some of you know this, but there's now a, you know, we have 911 for emergencies. There's now 988, so if you're having a mental health crisis, suicidal, you can call and there's a trained counselor uh, to talk about, to talk to you. Um, there's a couple different views that Christians have, you know, about depression. Uh, I'm just going to list some of the, some of the views. Um, first of all, there are some Christians out there that they just think that depression's a sin. I don't agree with that at all, um, or that all depression is a sin. And they're usually people that don't struggle themselves with depression. But they said, oh, it reveals, you know, a lack of faith in God. And, you know, it's God's judgment on sinful behavior, and, and, or it's just laziness. And, and then there's, on the other side of the spectrum, there's some people that just flatly declare that depression is a, a medical issue. Um, all depression is because of chemical imbalances, um, and so depression is no more wrong than, you know, than having the flu. Uh, and then there's people in the middle who aren't really sure exactly what depression is. Um, so, it, you know, faith seems to be related to it, um, but then there's brain chemicals, and so um, there's a lot of confusion about, about depression. Um, there's a couple reasons that we get depressed. Uh, first of all, we get depressed because it's often triggered by life circumstances. Something happens in our life. There's a death of a loved one, or there's a, a broke, you know, a broken relationship, or a loss of a job. 
um, or there's psychological problems such as abuse or low self-esteem. There's situational things in our life that lead us to be down, to be depressed. I mean, Jesus in the garden, he's down based on, on this situation uh, in his life. And some of these things are beyond our control and, and some aren't. And it's hard because, you know, the Bible says, you know, be filled with joy, the, the, which doesn't mean smile all the time. But it's not easy for someone who's suffering from a situational uh, depression. Uh, sometimes uh, when we're in those situations, God has given us some ways that can help. Uh, prayer can definitely help in depression. Uh, Bible study and application, support groups, uh, fellowship among believers can help. I mean, just having a friend sometimes can help our situational depression. Forgiveness can help. Sometimes biblical counseling for some big event that we really just can't get past. Jesus was in that situation, and what did he do? He prayed. He prayed in that situation. He asked his friends to help him. They didn't. They kind of bailed on him. Now, he didn't smile in the Garden of Gethsemane. He wasn't like, oh, this is great. But he had strength to fight the situation, to face the situation, because he prayed. And he submitted it to God. So sometimes we can do some things about situational depression. Sometimes we just need to grieve, and there's a process to that. And sometimes there's big life events in our life that can lead us uh, to being depressed. Um, personally, I don't feel that I've ever been clinically depressed, which I'll talk about in just a bit. But yeah, I've struggled with life circumstances. I mean, I get down about things, or once in a while I can get you know, in a funk, basically. Um, and, and I would say each situation is a little different. I mean, generally, I'm pretty positive, but I think most of us here, we can get depressed by life situations, by things that we can't control. Um, and there is things that we can do to try to, to help those. Um, and I just want to remind everyone out there, the holidays are coming. And, you know, it's a great time for family. And there's a lot of joy and excitement in it. Um, but just remember, for a lot of people, it's a very difficult time. Um, especially those that are missing a loved one. Especially those with broken family relationships, especially those that are going through you know, a hard time, holiday kind of puts a, a spotlight on some of that misery. I mean, Elvis called it a blue Christmas. And so just a reminder for us as a church is do what we can. There might be someone that we can reach out to, call them, have a, have a lunch or breakfast with them, invite them for table fellowship. This is a season, again, it's kind of got both highs and lows. And, and so we need to look out, look out for each other. The second thing about depression is, yes, you know, depression can be caused by sin. Um, we lived in a country that was incredibly godless. Well, guess what? Depression was incredibly high in that country. One of the highest rates in the world of depression and suicide in Czech Republic. Yes, depression can be caused by the consequences of our sin, the guilt of our sin, uh, that our conscience is, is speaking. Um, so yes, there is, you know, we can be depressed because we sin, we believe, you know, Satan's lies. Um, I once had a roommate, he was only my, only my roommate for five months, and um, he would say that he's kind of depressed and down all the time. Well... Part of his thing was he would sit there and listen to heavy metal music with questionable lyrics and he would sit there literally nonstop and watch horror movies and rated our movies all the time. And I'm like, well, of course you're depressed. Like you're putting that garbage in, you're going to get that garbage, you know, out. Um, so there are some times that depression is because it can be because we're absorbed in ourselves. I've probably been depressed in my life because I was just thinking about me <laughs> all the time. 
Narcissism can cause depression. Um, sometimes when we focus on others and serving others, uh, again, that can, be, that can be lifted. But then, I want to talk about this. There's clinical depression. Um, I haven't, don't believe that I've suffered from that uh, in my life. But I have a friend who does. I mean, he's very open about it. Um, he takes medicine. He's been to counseling for it. Um, kind of a high-low person. He likes to keep moving. Um, but he's been very honest with me about his struggles. And sometimes he just needs to reach out and he needs me to listen or to pray. Um, or he'll send a text. I'm just having a bad day. I'm just, I'm just struggling with it. My depression and, and again he's a Christian he's a great person just great person um, but he struggles because clinically I mean sometimes he just gets stuck um, clinical depression is a physical condition that has to be diagnosed by a physician it's not caused by unfortunate life circumstances and and the symptoms can't be alleviated by one's own will a lot of times People can really get stuck. And, and contrary to what people believe in the Christian community, clinical depression is not caused by sin. It's not caused by sin. It's, it's a chemical imbalance. It's a medical condition. I mean, seeing a doctor for depression is no different than seeing a doctor for, for an injury. Um, and, and today, in, in the Christian church, we have to be careful because there are people that are clinically depressed that are in our churches and sometimes they can be left to feel guilty. They can be left to feel defensive, left confused, left lost. Um, and, and that's a shame. I mean, the church needs to be a safe place where someone who's struggling with depression during greeting time can say, you know what, I'm having a bad day. I'm struggling with, with depression. Um, can you pray for me? You know, can you come, whatever helps that, that person. Um, so, I mean, what would you say if at breeding time someone, you said, how are you doing? And they said, well, I'm struggling with depression today. How would you, how would you react? What would you say to them? Um, so all that to say, depression is not exclusively a medical issue, and it's not exclusively an emotional or spiritual issue. I mean, there's many, many things that, that cause um, depression. Um, but sometimes the remedy um, is a good counselor. Sometimes you need medicine. Sometimes a change of scenery. I know for me, when I'm depressed, sometimes a change of scenery does me really, really uh, good. Um, sometimes we need to attend church more often and study the Word of God or prayer. Sometimes we need more community and a good friend. Sometimes we just need space and time just to get by ourselves. Sometimes we need dark chocolate <laughs> and a good laugh. But I just want to say this. Um, you know, we sympathize with the struggle of depression, and we sympathize with the battle of depression. And, and I just want to say God cares about depression. God cares about your depression. It's not lost on him. Um, he loves you. He adores you. And we can look forward to a time in the future when we won't have depression. When we will be, there will be no tears. There will be no depression. There will be no down times. There will be no getting in a funk. So we can look forward to that time where we don't struggle. Where we don't struggle. Let me pray for us uh, this morning. Dearly Father, this is a, a heavy topic. Um, I just want to lift up those who are struggling right now, who are struggling with clinical depression, struggling with situational depression. Father, even struggling with sin. Father, I, I just lift those people up to you Father, I, I pray um, for us that you would help us um, just as a church to really understand this and, and really love people who, who battle with this well. Um, 
So, Father, I, I just uh, pray for that. And, Father, I, I just pray um, not our will be done, but your will be done. Um, what an incredible prayer that Jesus prayed. Father, I, I just pray that we would be able to pray that too, that we would trust God despite the difficulties in our life, that we would um, just submit ourselves to, to his will. Um, so, Father, give us the same courage as Jesus had. Give us the same courage to face our Gethsemane moments. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, have a wonderful um, week. And, and just a reminder, next week we have a service uh, like normal at 10. And then uh, at 6 o'clock on the 18th at night, we have a Christmas candlelight uh, and a kids program. So.